<laughs> All right. Uh, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. What's up, man? How are you? Chilling, man, as per usual. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. I cannot complain ever. Um, I don't have coronavirus. So... And neither do I. <laughs> yes. I'm... Knock on wood. Maybe I yeah. maybe I do, and I just don't have the symptoms yet, and I'm yeah. Who spreading knows? it around the New York City subway system. Mm -hmm. But we did a whole half an episode on the coronavirus, so that's not what today is going to be about. <laughs> if you want to learn about that, just go back a few. <laughs> yeah, if you want to learn about that, the hysteria. Have you had um, coronavirus, uh, like that the meeting yet? Oh, yeah. I've gotten the emails, the meetings, the hand-washing uh, tutorials, all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple of meetings about corona as well, and um, I'm thinking it's a lot of it's hysteria. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we go into detail about it. There are things to be concerned about, but also there are things not to be concerned about. You know, take it or leave it. That's pretty much all you know. Well, there's a lot that we could talk about today that is pretty relevant to some of the stories that we've been talking about over the past, I don't know. Few weeks, years, whatever. Years, <laughs> the past year uh, regarding pretty much what we cover in the Middle East, which is 70% of what we do on this show. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm is do Middle Eastern history plus politics. Um, all right, we're doing the 30-year war today. Yeah, and <laughs> just put the it reason, out there. <laughs> I'll just put it out there instead of like having some buildup. Um, it's also the title of the show. Uh, we're talking about the 30-year war today because we often use it as a metaphor to explain some of the contem contemporary issues that are going on today within the Middle East concerning uh you know sectarian violence and, and things like that religious and divides religious like that, divide yeah. and state mm -hmm. building and geopolitics because the 30-year war is a pretty good analogy and it's a pretty good metaphor and it really came to me that yeah we use this metaphor a lot however the last time i really remember studying this subject i think was in college in like in, like european history classes yeah same mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, I should definitely, we should definitely dive deeper into this subject because there's a lot of interesting characters, there's a lot of interesting themes, and uh, Jesus Christ, it was a horrible, horrible war. Yeah. So, we're going to talk about that today, and uh, hopefully it generates interest on your side, and uh, what I guess what we're trying to do today is not sound like AP high school hist European history professors because that's the yeah. last thing I want to do yeah so we're going to keep this chill I think yeah <laughs> yeah we're going to keep this chill we both open up beers <laughs> so um, we don't usually drink on this podcast but when we do we drink Corona I drink Bitburger <laughs> that's, that's a German beer yeah there you go um, also uh, this topic is incredible can be incredibly boring right because it happened a fucking long time ago and the only people who have capitalized on on like you know, this is historians and they, and I picked up this one book, uh, on audible, uh, f you know, for the purpose of researching this, it was like a 19 hour audible book. And I tried my best to just like speed it up to try to get through it faster. It's called the 30 years war, um, by, by Charlton Griffin. It's actually a good book, but fuck, is it dry? Like it's boring as you hell. You can do audible books. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, I, I just like, I, I don't have the patience to sit and have my eyes look at paid like like text like when i'm on a subway i'd rather like listen because I'm, I'm an attentive listener you know i mean maybe that's why we do this show <laughs> but like i like listening to the story you know just tell me about it and it feels like especially if there's a good narrator on the on the audiobook just feels like you know homies telling me the story but this homie wrote a really boring story so uh you know I got about halfway through it, and I was just like, all right, forget it. I'm going to do my own damn research. Uh, so, you know, I got to Googling, and uh, hopefully what, what we have for you today is interesting. Audible is all about the narrator. You need yeah. a good narrator on your yeah. Audible book. Totally. If not, then it can become incredibly boring. Yeah, also, I we're not sponsored by Audible yet. Yeah, so. we're not sponsored by Audible, so we can't say that we we disavow any type of audio book format <laughs> yeah we want to leave that door open maybe <laughs> yeah we've got to leave that door open also we've sponsored uh, blinkus has sponsored us so, right and they do that but the thing with audible is that if it's a good narrator then yeah fine i can listen to an audible book i once got this audible book of it was the history of the dark ages and mm -hmm. it was written in like 1886 or something it was a very old a lot of eyes and a vows, very huh? a very old book <laughs> 
<laughs> and I was like, hmm, I want to learn about the Dark Ages. And it wasn't even in English. It was in English. <laughs> it was in English. But it was not in English that I could understand or I could listen to. <laughs> I, I was, was like, I can't, this, I can't retain any of this. <laughs> Clovis the Fourth? Uh, um, but yeah, uh, back to the Thirty Year War. Yep. So let's jump in. As we... Uh, as we act very juvenile. Um, so I guess to lead it off, um, it, it's a hard it, it's a hard topic to really hit because it's incredibly complex. And, and there's 30 years of it. <laughs> there's 30 years of it. This is an hour and a half podcast. And there's so many different themes that you could hit. While preparing for this, I really struggled on like how to actually do this show. That's why Danny and I decided to just say, fuck it, let's just drink a beer and just like have a casual conversation. But I'll just kick it off. Did you think that Martin Luther could anticipate what would happen? Wow, you're really jumping in there. Um, So I'll give you the short answer and then I need to give context because people might not know what this means. Um, Yeah, so do I think he would realize it? I think Martin Luther was smart enough to understand that it would cause trouble uh, and that it might start a war. Uh, However, uh, I think he didn't give a shit. And also, I don't think he could have known it would have taken, it would have caused a 30-year war or longer, really. Um, So that's kind of my short answer. But for context, for those that aren't hip to Martin Luther, we're not talking about MLK Jr., right? We're talking about the All guy right, that he's named after. Our audience isn't that stupid. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. Uh, so this guy, he's a, a German uh, um, uh, a priest, if you will, right? And he uh, basically had some very core tenets. Uh, really interesting, dude. We did a podcast, like I feel like over a year ago, on this guy. We'll probably try and have to dig that up and either redo it or like post it as a classic episode or something like that. But super interesting guy. He was really smart, you know, studied to be a lawyer, but then eventually, you know, he almost got struck by lightning one day and, you know, he prayed to like some saint for, you know, his salvation and then decided to become a priest. And, you know, he came from a somewhat wealthy family and his dad was super pissed at him about it. And he was like, fuck it, I'm going to be a priest because, you know, God. Um, And uh, basically flash forward a little while and this dude was smart, right? He was training to be a lawyer and what he started noticing was these peculiarities with the, the the Roman Catholic Church, right, which dominated the region uh, that we you know now known as uh, Central Europe, but like you know talking about mostly what present day Germany, a lot of you know Czechoslovakia, Austria, things like that, places in that central parts of France, of course, too, um, all that central uh, German area, and the the issues that were happening there um, was you know, the political issue, I I should say, is that the Holy Roman Empire was basically sucking the German people dry uh, through uh, the sale of indulgences. Let's peel this back a little bit. So the Catholic Church, it's expensive to run a a, a church system, especially... Especially one so lavish as the Catholic Church. Especially one that has wealthy churches and and monasteries and, and... a lot of land and one of the ways that they would profit is that they started selling indulgences and that was martin luther's main gripe against the church right and and, and indulgences know. specifically were you sin everyone sins but specifically you sin and if you pay the church money they will absolve you of your sins now i don't know what the going rate for sins was um but they would peddle this shit like you know oh you're You know, you're a sinner. If you don't do this, you're going to burn in hell and all this, you know, fire and brimstone shit. But they they got really dirty about they were like, oh, your family members who have died are burning in hell right now. And if you don't pay us, they're going to they're going to continue to burn. You know, it's real fucked up, you know. And I think, you know, obviously Luther didn't like this very much, but also, you know, the bigger tenet of of Lutherism is like the idea of, you know, whether um, whether acts you know, like things that you do, like going to church and being Catholic and all that stuff, um, were what got you into heaven or whether, you know, faith alone got you into heaven. And, you know, he was on the faith alone kind of thing, which made him very, like very radical for the Catholic church. And the Catholic church was like the G 
of the entire region, right? They owned more, like the majority of the land of, of Europe, you know? So like they were a very powerful entity and like, so one day in Wittenberg, this, this dude, Martin Luther decides to, you know, what the equivalent of like posting on Facebook, like an angry political rant. Uh, it wasn't angry, but it was just like a open call to action. Like, Hey, debate me on these, these 95 topics that I find fucked up about the Catholic church. Right. And he just opened up the debate for it and it, whew, talk about pissing people off. Right. It pissed off this church. And like at the time, the church was known for like throwing, like burning people and throwing their ashes into a river when you, you know, just even thought about going against them. So this dude has some serious balls. Well, the issue was is that, well, one of the things that made it go viral was the fact that at the same time, the printing press was Mm -hmm. invented. Yep. And what happened was basically a media war. So think about like right wing and east right did I say right wing and east wing? <laughs> right wing, <laughs> right wing, east east side, west side. Uh right wing and le- uh, and uh and left wing Twitter or right wing and, and left wing media, there was basically a media war in the um Catholic in the versus version, Protestant, in the version yeah. of flyers that were going across Europe and, you know, one would release, you know, one flyer, the other one would release something to counter that. Right. And then eventually this caused a schism within the church, which was the the big fear that this would cause an eventual, not just, um, n- not just, um, a, um, what the, what word am I looking for right now? Um, I'm not necessarily sure where you're going, but what, one important point was that, you know, what Martin Luther was doing was basically uh, undermining the hegemony of the Catholic Church because another really important thing that he did was he translated uh, the, the the Bible from, like, Latin, which nobody spoke, um, only, like, priests and shit, and he translated it into, like, the common German, right? Uh, and this is important because it basically said, like, hey, do you want to learn about God and you want to be, like, a good, you know— christian or whatever like you can read the bible your damn self right and then you know at the time you know people only received the word of god through priests through catholic priests right so they could basically tell you anything they wanted and you wouldn't know any different you know uh and you know this kind of decentralized faith for for people and a lot of people who came over to the protestant camp the lutheran camp you know, they were like, well, shit, I can read this damn Bible myself. And also a lot of the things you do are contradictory to this Bible. So like, we're going to do our own thing, right? We're going to worship God our own way. Uh, and the Catholic Church didn't like that because their, their, their stranglehold on God, their monopoly on God was what was funding their entire operation, basically. Well, and this eventually turned into war. Like it was a, it yep. was a war of ideas that turned into actual, actual battle and violence. And the, the battle, I mean, the violence started breaking out in the 1500s. It started in Germany. It spread all throughout Europe. It, went, it was in France. It was in Britain. It was in, it was pretty much in every state uh, within Europe, or almost, not every state, but many states within Europe. Um, there was the French wars of religion. Mm-hmm. There were there were uh, wars between the various princes, Catholic princes and Protestant princes within within German states. There were wars in in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, religious wars, and you can draw a comparison between the Sunnis and Shiite war and the Sunnis and Shiite wars in the Middle East. But I think as we go on, I think it will be a lot more clear that these wars are more so about political power rather than theological differences. Right. They may start off as theological differences, like in in Islam, where the arguments over the lineage of, of the lineage of Muhammad, um, and there's really not that much. I'm sure Islamic scholars would would say I'm wrong about this, but as far as like a Western Christian would how would perceive <laughs> it, they they don't see too many differences between Shia Islam and uh, in, uh, in Sunni Islam. It's kind of the same thing with Christianity as well. We're talking about interpretations of, of biblical text and interpretations and, and of, uh, of how you think that the how church should, ultimate, should, yeah. should ultimately be ran, whether it should be uh, from a centralized authority or should there be a direct relationship with, with, with a person and God. So we're talking about an ideology, an ideological battle 
that turned into a violent battle all across Europe in the 1500s. And that's when Europe's religious wars really started to break out. Right. Now, what ended up happening is that there was... So, I'm going to lay the groundwork right now about like what the 30-year war. Well, Things fell apart in Europe in the 30 Days War. It, it lasted from 1618 to 1648. It was an enormously complex combination of the different processes of forming a state. Right. And, and it was a combination of state formation, geopolitics, and ideological conflict wrapped into one massively destructive series of conflicts in Central Europe. Um, just to give some context on the, on the type of devastation that took place during this war, um, the population of Germany went from 21 million to 13 million. One out of every three Germans died in this germ in this generation, and the male population was cut in half. Right. I read another stat that said uh, that the percentage of people that died, as you know, um, like what percent of the t overall population uh, on the planet that died in this war, was only superseded in. Um, I think it was like May of 1945 <laughs> during the Second World War, you know, so and this was before fucking tanks and machine guns and, you know, mustard gas and all this other crazy shit. So talk about devastating. It was before modern warfare existed um, and there were still cavalry charges. But granted, a lot of these people died of, of things like plague and, and just starving to death right. due to famine. Uh, because of resource constraints, things like that. Re yeah. yeah, resource constraints. Also, just witch hunts were a thing, and witch, witch hunts. hunts. They were and burning witch people. Hunts. Yeah. Well, a good a good quote about this war is that it's from Veronica uh, Wedgwood. The war solved no problem. It affects both immediate and indirect were either either negative or disastrous, morally subversive, economically destructive, socially degrading, confused in its causes devious in its course futile in its result it is the outstanding example in european european history of meaningless conflict you could literally replace the word european here with middle east and be talking yeah. about like our current wars the outstanding example of meaningless conflict within mm -hmm. europe and mm -hmm. i agree with that statement because mm -hmm. when you dive into the weeds of it the war really didn't solve anything it nonsense yeah it just produced a lot of I don't know. Maybe some people will, will see some of the outcomes as positive things, depending on what your what ideological perspective right. is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However, it started out as a sectarian war. It turned into a, geopol a geopolitical hodgepodge. And um, what you get at the end of the war is the is the creation of modern states. Right. Now, if you took a person in a time machine and a person from the... 1500s let's just say if you grab them and said hey let's come let's go to the 21st century and you showed them the united nations they would be like what the fuck is the united Na like what nations like what the hell is a nation right like, where are your united empires Na like Fr like what italy like italy's a nation germany's a nation like Fr like what what is this it wasn't like that back in the day um, and these were feudal states that were governed by that were governed by sirens in the background <laughs> that were governed by sirens in the background that like to destroy podcast. These were feudal states that the, the map of Europe in the 1500s looked nothing like the map of Europe now. Yeah. Let's let's start there. Yeah. So there are 44 countries in Europe. I think there's 44 countries in Europe, depending on where you draw that border. The most common border is in is in Russia. Um, well, believe it or not, Europe looked a lot different. There were over a thousand independent states, duchesses, principalities, um, empires, self-determining villages, not empires, kingdoms. These are just the independent states that had autonomy from the, whole, the Holy Roman Empire. What the Holy Roman Empire really was, was at that time, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, of, of a ceremonial type thing. So the, 30, the, the Holy Roman Empire, 
it, it depends on really where you start this. Uh, historians do argue about the actual birth of the Holy Roman Empire. It's like either 800 with Charlemagne or like 1,000 with the fuck with that guy's name. I'm forgetting with, it. With uh, Otto the First. Yeah, Otto the Great of, or whatever. Germany, yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's actually debate between that, whether it started you know, with Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, because he was crowned Holy Roman Empire by Pope Leo II um, after the Roman Empire split into two from east to west. Or when, I believe it was Otto the First, he helped pr- protect the, 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 the papal states from... Uh, these Italian invaders, and he was crowned Holy Roman Empire. And really, I mean, I have trouble with what exactly the Holy Roman Empire was, but there's a famous quote from Voltaire that um, I think he said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither Holy Roman or an empire. I might be paraphrasing that or getting yeah, the order of how he said that correctly. neither Holy nor Roman nor an empire. Yeah. Neither Holy nor Roman nor empire. So but he didn't it, say that until well after, so... Um, well, after that decline there, um, there was no different. There was, it was not a continuation of, of Marcus Aurelius, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't wasn't a continuation of the Roman empire that we associate with the Colosseum and fighting lions and Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. Right. That part does get a little confusing. All of that juicy things. And I remember when I was younger, when I was reading about this in in my textbooks and and like, you know, whatever history classes I was taking, there would be a chapter, you know, you'd read about the antiquities, uh, you would read about ancient Greece, ancient Rome, then you'd get to the Middle Ages, and then once you get to like a late period in the Middle Ages, all of a sudden you see a big chunk map saying Holy Roman Empire. And I was like, what the hell is yeah, this? Yeah, like, who is this? Yeah. What is, like, what is this country? Like, Rome yeah. came back? When did this happen? Yeah. And this was probably in high school. Um, I was always very in- incredibly confused. Basically, the Holy Roman Empire was a union between a large, a, an elected king from powerful families that had a union with the Catholic Church that had some loose authority over what is now Germany and right. Prague and Bo- you know Bohemia and the different parts of Central Europe. What's funny about that is that there was another Holy Roman Empire at the same time when this when this one started, and that was over in Constantinople. What we that would wasn't now a call, Holy Roman Empire. That was just the Eastern Roman Empire. If you, that was if you ask them, they were the Holy Roman Empire. They we, call themselves the Holy Roman Empire in the East? Yeah, dude. Uh, but we now call them the Byzantine Empire uh, because it was in the, in the you know mostly Greek-led uh, city of Byzantium or whatever they called it. Um, but uh, yeah, at, when it was being formed, either in 800 or 1000, whichever point you want to talk about, there was already a home, a Holy Roman Empire. Like, see, I it's 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 fucked up. It's crazy. I don't understand how they even got the name Holy Roman Empire. I mean, I, uh, I don't the, know. Byzant- the Byzantinian Empire. How did they get that name in the first place? Byz- Byzant- it comes from Byzantium, it, which is the original name. Of they never called themselves that, though. No, they never did. But we we start we as in, by we I mean like modern history calls it that because of the. To, to to clear up the confusion of there being two Holy Roman Empires. Well, we should just call them the Eastern Roman Empire. That is another that's name what for they, it. That's what they were. The yeah, Eastern that's... European Empire. <laughs> Eastern the, Roman they, Empire. They, the Eastern Roman Empire. They were they were the Roman Empire. They, they were the they, actual the Romans, Roman Empire. They <laughs> split their. They moved their capital, the constant to to, visit to uh, Byzantium uh, during what third uh, the late. For, uh, fourth century, prior to the sack of the of Rome from the right. Visigoths, right? Um, but I digress. Man, we're going far far into the past here. Um, but yeah, let's, so let's get where, back. Let's, Holy Roman back Empire. to the thirty year. Back to the thirty year war. <laughs> it was. It's confusing. I don't want to dive too far into the weaves of it, but before we jump into that, though, I do want to talk about the Peace of Augsburg. Um, because we did talk about how you know Martin Luther set off this like you know fire. Uh, with between Protestants and, and, and Catholics 
you know, and they were fighting for a while and they started carving up new states and, and like there were winners and losers and way too much to talk about in that respect. But how that concluded at the time was at the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, which established a really important thing that we needed to, to talk about to, to talk about the Thirty Years War, which is uh, I'm going to butcher this because I don't speak Latin, but actually, I don't think anyone can actually speak Latin. There's like debates on how to pronounce things. Anyway, uh, it's quius regno eus religio, right? And that means whoever rules dictates the religion. Um, and what that means is like if you're a little, you know, village king or whatever, your principality, you know, if he was a Protestant, then cool you're a protestant and if the other one is a catholic then cool you can be a catholic and somehow they figured out this piece this loosely formed piece um through this this dictate uh and but this ex excluded calvinists which are like a brand of protestants you know it's like a they're they're not the same i i'm not a religious or theological there scholar, was a break off so. between calvinist yeah. and luther's uh, Th there's, there's a difference there's, there's another version in the peace of <laughs> augsburg didn't yeah. include them in this settlement between catholics and luther's of of lutherans of, right of lutherans you didn't get that same privilege of you know having a a, a prince who may have been a calvinist and <clears> being able to to, to live there in peace. They were cool with were, Catholics and they were cool with Lutherans, but not Calvinists. <laughs> right. Yeah. So essentially, you'd have to be what your leader was. If not, you'd have to either convert or emigrate somewhere else. Yeah, but this this actually brought up some problems, honestly. Um, and we'll get into those problems. But, you know, before we start there, I just kind of want to break up the 30 years war into like, 12 and a half year segments it's not actually 12 and a half years each but there are four phases of the 30 years war uh we have a bohemian phase which is how it started we have a danish phase uh we have a swedish phase and then finally we have a french phase so phases one and two the bohemian and the danish these are the ones that we're going to talk about uh, are going to be like mostly religious mostly centralized within you know very small areas of uh, I mean, small relatively to the Thirty Years' War, but smaller areas of the Holy Roman Empire. Whereas the third and fourth, the Swedish and French phases, were definitely different. They were very, just very much more political and had a way broader range, right? So not just on that mainland, it was fucking everywhere. Um, well, let's let, let's let's start off with how the war breaks out. Like, right. what is the what is the uh, assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand moment look like with this war? For sure, um, what it looks like. So, there's war in Europe. There's a settlement made for the, through the Peace of Augsburg. It sets up some type of ceasefire between the conflicts that were going on between Catholics and Protestants. However, there is a ruler. The the current at this time, the current Holy Roman Empire emperor. Uh, Ferdinand II was a very devout Catholic, and you know, I'm not sure what his entire intentions were on this. Um, I'm not a historian on this subject, obviously. However, the way that I perceive it is that he was a very devout Catholic, and he did feel he did have some type of religious motive to destroy the remnants of any type of Protestant movement that was in Central Europe. Right. So he was going to dictate in his in the Bohemian territories. He he was um, he he dictated that they had to convert to Catholicism, and his messengers were thrown out the window. Oh, don't kill it! Uh, I had a really good setup for that one. <laughs> uh, what is it called? Uh, it all right. So hold on. Be, be, uh, you, you jump ahead a little bit. There's some important things to know here. Uh, so bo Bohemia, because this is not a lot of people might not know this because it's not a like a city state anymore. Um, Bohemia, is a, it was a kingdom in what is today Czechia and Slovakia or Czechoslovakia. I don't know. They changed their names like a few times in the last 10 years. Um, so it was ruled by a branch of the Habsburg family, which we also have to talk about. Um, and the Habsburg family was basically this like big 
you know, family that owned a ton of land and were kings and queens and princes of a lot of different areas in Europe. I mean, the major ones, of course, were, you know, big parts of the Holy Roman Empire, definitely the uh, Bohemia, um, but also places like France and places like Italy and the Netherlands. Um, all of them were ruled by, you know, this very incestuous family called the Habsburgs, right? They were like the the Bilderbergs or whatever, you know, uh, of the time. And uh, so, like you said, Henry, uh, the, the, the Bohemia was, was actually a Protestant majority kingdom, right? And it was ruled by a Catholic. So when we go back to that quius um, uh, regno eus religio, the, the whoever rules dictates the religion rule that we got in the Peace of Augsburg, you know, what happens there, right? So we have a Protestant majority kingdom, that's ruled by a Catholic. So do they all have to be Catholic, right? So that becomes a bit of a problem, right? Um, and this, I, I guess if we wanted to talk about like in modern terms, this this reminds me of some contemporary parallels. Like for example, we had an episode about Kashmir, right? And you know, how, how that state was formed or how that unique issue of an area <laughs> uh, came about. And Kashmir initially was uh, they they were ruled by a, a, like a former Hindu. Um, excuse me, he was always a Hindu. They were formerly ruled by a Hindu, but they are a Muslim majority territory, right? And so there was some conflicts there, and and that's a a big, at least the initial part of why Kashmir is all messed up, right? Or we can talk about how you know in Iraq, you know Sunni leader Shia majority, right? Um, so to mitigate this issue right of like a catholic ruler protestant everyone um the Habsburgs they made an official decree before ferdinand ii took over uh and that was uh uh they issued a letter of majesty which basically said all right cool you guys can be protestant right it, specifically in bohemia right yes you're catholic you know uh king or whatever but whatever you guys can be be you can do whatever you want be protestant that's cool but like you said you know ferdinand he came in and and we don't really know what his motivations are and frankly i'm sure some historians might i think (laughs) i think i mean the motivations that i've read his motivation was that he was he was a religious zealot and he wanted to spread catholicism he came from a very yeah he was uh, jesuit educated family he was jesuit educated Mm -hmm. um now you know it's kind of funny because jesuits now are, are like the liberal priest uh, back right. in the day, they were very hardcore priests. Right. It's like the Franciscans and the Dominicans are the harder, you know, the, are the more strict priests in, in contemporary Catholicism. But in the Jesuits are seen as like, oh, you know, the Jesuits are a bunch of liberals. Um, but back then it was very different. Right. Okay. So back to this, you know, like, issue. So this resulted in, like, big issues. But one of the funniest, like, real life, this is Sparta moments that I've ever heard of. And it's it's hilarious. And officially, it's called the Defenstration of Prague. And actually, this was the second one. So Ferdinand II, he he sent some messengers over to give you know the Protestants like notice that like hey we're pulling out of the uh, JCPOA, the Letter of Majesty here, right? And and this is exactly like how in the movie Three Hundred Xerxes sends you know that like messenger guy over to Leonidas, uh, and well you know these bohemians weren't having it right so defenstration is just like an sat word for throwing someone out of a window and that's exactly what they did to these guys they straight up threw their asses out of a four-story window and the fucking funny part about this is that they lived they survived the guys that they threw out the window survived and we're talking about like a i don't know it's 80 foot drop right um crazy uh, so if, at the time, if you asked a Catholic, like about this, they'd be like, oh, the angels saved them. And, you know, it justified Ferdinand the second's holy decree to force the Protestants to be, you know, Catholic or whatever. But the Protestants had a more realistic theory. And I think it's, uh, they say that they just landed in a pile of shit and that's what broke their fall. <laughs> so when I first read about the, de- the defenestration of Prague, mm-hmm. I immediately assumed it was a word for something like rape. Like a rape <laughs> yeah, of Prague, like, like it, the right? rape of Nain Like the deflowering like of that. Prague. Yeah. Or like a or word for humiliation like the Nakba. 
You know, one right, of those very right. intense like periods, but no, it just literally means throwing it's a, somebody it's out a of a window. It's a fun word, man. It's a fun word. But yeah, the the Catholics were like, it was the angels. They asked for Mother Mary, and they sent the angels to guide their fall and <laughs> save them. And then the Protestants were like, no, they just fell in a in a pile of shit. <laughs> Which is Literally, probably more true. Which is obviously <laughs> what probably happened is they fell in yeah. something that saved their lives, yeah. and it could have very well been some big some some piles of cow poo or human. Who knows? You know, they didn't or really human have really poo, very but good, it was probably you know. just a bunch of cow dung, right? And uh, what's funny about this is this is not the first time that they did this. This is the second defenestration of Prague. So th these bohemians are badass. Like, they have a, a tendency of, like, throwing you out of a window if they don't like what you're saying, which is hilarious. And Ferdinand II was so pissed about this, obviously, you know, just like Xerxes, right? And he decided to, you know, issue a show of force. So they had this battle of White Mountain. Have you heard about this one? Yeah, it's when uh, Frederick V and, and Ferdinand, they met in the battlefield. I'm not sure if Ferdinand was there, but they met. I he think definitely they did wasn't meet. there. They, I think they did actually meet in the battlefield. Did they? Uh, yeah. I always, um, I always pin Ferdinand II sure. as like a pussy. Sorry. <laughs> so they met the Catholic forces overwhelmingly oh, yeah, destroyed they spanked the Protestant them. forces. Yeah, they, they fucking spanked him. Um, but what's important to note in this battle, as well as some of the smaller skirmishes around the time, um, was that it was hyper local and like in central a holy roman empire right it was like it was a local thing it was a it was a domestic issue you know and then you know we we kind of bring up this like new phase of the war right that was kind of the bohemian part right and so the danish part is when denmark jumps in right so denmark uh was a lutheran kingdom right uh so danish people are from denmark uh and denmark is in the way north of mainland Europe. It's just over present day Germany, right? So basically the king in the north decides to fight to help out his Protestant homies in the south and he gets wrecked by some sellsword mercenary named Wallenstein. Uh, so I, I know you know more about this guy than I do. You want to talk a little bit about him? Yeah, he was just a really rich mercenary who, I mean, the 30-year war, almost every single one of the soldiers in that war were mercenary soldiers, a lot like the Middle East right now. They were mercenaries, and what they would do is they were pretty, they were incredibly brutal. And the way that he would enlist his soldiers is that he's, he's I'm not going to pay you, but I will let you essentially uh, just pillage and Rape, take whatever loot, you want. Pillage, right? So. You have the authority to go into anyone's house, take anything that you want, rape their wives, murder them. It's all fair game. So it, th that's how they that's how these mercenaries made their money. They would just they would live off the land and pillage the land. And that's why the conflict was so terrible. It wasn't that so many people died in conflict like in World War Two, where there is millions of people who died casualty. There's millions of civilian casualties directly due to to bombing raids and just war atrocities. A lot of these people just died because all of their shit was stolen and they'd starve to death. Right. right. And diseases would spread as well because a lot of these mercenaries were foreign. So Wallenstein was the guy who, who was gaining tremendous power during this war. And he was eventually assassinated because of it because Frederick II was like this guy's getting way too powerful we got to take him out right and he was a cell sword like right. he considered he was you know I read some things that he was considering switching to the Protestant side at one point right as long as they can pay him <laughs> yeah as yeah. long as as long as whatever side was the winning side really that's and how a lot of mercenaries work for they sure. rather work for the winning side because that's I mean, if you lose if money. you work for the losing side you die who's gonna pay you well you die <laughs> you, you die yeah I, it, what's important to note about this one and and you know it, you know wallenstein you know it, it's still again local right still in the holy roman empire and wallenstein actually managed to push him out of the holy roman empire the, De the danish and push them way back into denmark and denmark was having some trouble like holding him back until the swedes well just to add some some more context with the danish i mean that could be seen as a political thing because they just don't want inf like the danish 
the king the kingdom of dane or danish kingdom denmark kingdom of denmark, denmark. The, the, the kingdom of dane <laughs> <laughs> um you can tell i've been drinking on this i like the kingdom of dane more it sounds like a game of thrones house yeah right i'm not gonna lie i totally thought of all of these this entire war in the context of Game of Thrones, absolutely and not, not vice versa, which yeah. is a problem in itself. <laughs> that I'm thinking of, like, hmm, I should compare this real history with a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I'll see the comparisons because I know the fairy tale more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been studying this fairy tale for for very many years. I'm an expert on the on the historical work of George R. R. Martin, right? Anyway, Swedes, so um, Swedish phase, right? So we got the Swedish phase. So until this point in the war, uh, what's important to remember is that the fighting had been centralized in the Holy Roman Empire and was largely about religious divides and cultural divides and about, you know, how people can practice, you know, their preferred religions. Um, But by the start of the Swedish phase, we start seeing powers from outside of the Holy Roman Empire start jumping in, right? And this changes the whole dynamic of the war. Right, from a local religious fight to kind of a regional geopolitical struggle. And you know, it, it honestly has so many parallels to what's going on in the Middle East. You know, uh, whether you're talking about like Sunni and Shia divides and different sectarian divides, as well as cultural divides. But then they all balloon in, into this like global geopolitical conflict with fewer and fewer regional interests playing a role in the fight and more and more large outside forces jumping in to intervene right and the same exact thing was happening at this point uh that the swedes started jumping in now we also see some parallels uh in the swedish and french phases to our current middle east conflicts when you think about some of the seemingly contradictory alliances and kind of the flip-flopping that happens uh, but we'll talk a bit more about on um, uh, that in a second um but the guy you need to know about about the swedish phase is Gustavus Adolphus, and he was the king of Sweden and a Lutheran. And this guy's a major fucking badass. Yeah, Gustavus Adolphus is known as, a fa- as the father of modern warfare. He's a Protestant king. Um, the stories written about him are almost on... They almost seem biblical in their nature. However, he went down he intervened with the funding of france which is a catholic power which like what the fuck you know like that's what everybody else was thinking but when you think about why it's actually pretty simple well it's it's pretty simple when you look at a map of that time and you see that where france is physically located in Europe at that time. They're sandwiched between the Habsburgs. So you have the, the Habsburg family. Essentially, again, they're just a, they're a royal family that has mul- they have multiple thrones. Um, they're like the Kennedys of that time or something like that, however you want to compare it, but a very powerful royal family. At one point, the Habsburgs had the, 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 the king of, uh, I think it was the king of Austria and the king of Spain were brothers. Mm-hmm. So they were sandwiched in between both Spain as well as the Holy Roman Empire. So they wanted to balance out the power. So that's why the French intervened financially on the Swedes, with, with the Swedes. Right. And, and another thing is like France and Spain were having this like tiff over, you know, areas in the south like Sicily and parts of Italy. You know, so they had been fighting each other for a minute. So the, the, the French rulers uh, and, you know, the Habsburgs were just not friends. And so at the moment that, you know, um, this war in the Holy Roman Empire started escalating, uh, France kind of saw this as an opportunity to be like, oh, shit, well, all we got to do is give some money to these Swedish dudes um, and they'll go fight the war and we'll weaken the Habsburgs' grip on the region. And hopefully, you know, I, I guess maybe they thought they can claim some extra territory or something like that. But more importantly, it was just like we we hate the Habsburgs more than we are Catholics and don't like the Protestants. <laughs> And to add some some more context, it's, it's about balancing out the the, the power within mm-hmm. Europe. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily because like oh we hate them more. It's more about like hey listen like 
France at this time it was a more centralized state than the Holy Roman Empire ever was. Right. France was way more unified. Right. It was like one. They thing. had way more statesmen mm-hmm. concerned with preserving, a, you know, a French identity and a French state. On the other side, over the, the whole in the Holy Roman Empire, we're talking about thousands of different independent principalities. Yeah. Principalities, mm-hmm. thousands of them that had their own autonomy. So an identity. it was yep. way mm-hmm. more complex. And right. like going into what how the Holy Roman Empire, I was reading about the Holy Roman Empire before over the past two weeks. I've stopped because it was just way too complicated the way that system was set up in place. Like how they, how they interacted. There was overlapping borders where some provinces had autonomy and others. It was a complete... It was a mess nuts it was a complete mess i think france was way more concerned about that the you know there being a, a unified central european state that would be a direct threat to france with their ally the spanish right below them because they would be completely alone in the case of any type of any type of global conflict so it was in their geopolitical interest to fund the swedes to make sure that that state couldn't form. And I think going back to the theme of this podcast, I think this was kind of, this war was kind of a, a uh, act of state building gone completely wrong because the, the process of building a state is bloody, is incredibly bloody. And you can see that with almost every single, with, with most states, there's a very bloody aspect in forming that national identity. And you can see that in, in places in the Middle East right now with the creations of these modern Middle Eastern states. You can see that with the creation of a lot of these states in, in Asia. You can talk about the Tokugawa period in Japan, right. which was created from which created Japan into feudal states into a unified Japan with a shogun. With power, um, you could talk about England with the War of the Roses and the civil wars, the brutal civil wars that took place there. It's a form. It's a, it's a it's it's a it's the cons, it's consolidating power more so, I think, than the theological differences between two camps or two parties are the real reasons why these wars take place. A lot of these warriors, a lot of these soldiers in this war, they were mercenary soldiers. They didn't have some type of ideological drive to fight the other side. They were just doing it because of their own greed and to take whatever they could get. The war may have started out that way with things like freedom of religion and, and, and things like that, but ultimately it turned into politics. And... Going back to when we were talking about the outbreak of the, the initial war between, you know, the localized war that took place in Bohemia, a lot of that has to do with the wealth of the Catholic Church and and bishops that were converts to Luther's to, to Lutherism. I'm sorry, I'm butchering pretty much every word I say this episode. <laughs> A lot of that has to do with Dane. the con- I called the I called the uh, ninety five thesis the ninety fifth thesis in the beginning yeah. of the episode. I didn't I didn't correct myself. That's all right. <laughs> so there were a lot of it had to do with a lot of the bishops that had all this land that was built up through the height of the Middle Ages, who converted to Protestantism and fighting for those resources as well. So a lot of it, always, these conflicts have to do with the consolidation of power, and the, they happen. The people of these of these different provinces happen to be divided by some type of sectarian divide, meaning that if one side gets power, the other side is oppressed or is forced to immigrate or leave or convert. So I think those are really the stem, what stems the power. You know, it's all about it's all about the money and the resources and creating a state that can give handouts to a specific group or not. Um, so just just to add that. Some context. In, yep. Just context into the overall theme of the wars. Now going back to the geopolitical stuff with France, 
France was more central, centralized. They did not want a formation of the state right next door to them. That would be their. That would be a big threat. They fund the Swede, and it's fought Swedes. The Swede, in particular, <laughs> this badass general yeah. kind of Stannis Baratheon type character. You know, you can all bring these back to Game of Thrones characters. Yep. Where Danny and I were arguing who is who is Gustavus Adolphus in terms right. of the Game of Thrones universe. I, I said he Stannis. was Rob Stark. I think it's you, Stannis. You said he was Stannis Baratheon. Yeah, I think it's Stannis because, uh, and 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 this is I want to go into a bit of like a military tech rant, but like you know ancient military tech rant because this I was going to do more about the French phase after this, and I literally just stopped at the Swedish phase because I loved how much I was learning about it. So, um, all right, why I think he's like Stannis. Uh, so Adolphus was a military commander, and he was super ha- hands-on, right? He was, like, in the cavalry charges, right? And and that was his claim to fame. That was what, why he did so well. And more importantly, he was given the title, like, posthumously, like, after he died, uh, the, the father of modern warfare, you know. Uh, and this came about because he revolutionized the way that uh, national armies were built. He revolutionized the way that uh, people like deploy mobile artillery and how people you know think about a standing army right um so uh where can i start shit uh okay so when when gustavus adolphus took the throne uh sweden was definitely not like a major military power uh sweden is up way up in the north like they're kind of close to poland and russia and things like that um and both of those regional powers could have easily spanked the swedes um, their soldiers were super ill-equipped, ill-trained. Um, also they had like this power of uh, this problem of, of like not enough manpower. Right. So they had this, obviously they're super, super North. They're like in, in the, you know, white Walker zone here. And it's like harsh climate, you know, uh, and, and the harsh climate of that Northern, uh, uh, European area, it just brought problems with recruitments. So, you know, in the, in the North long, brutal winters meant, that they couldn't really grow as much food. And so for that reason, a lot of men chose to stay in their farms and not waste time fighting uh, and rather, you know, use that time to grow enough food to make ends meet, right? But Adolphus, he basically changed the way, you know, that they were recruiting by enacting some policies to basically create a professional, well-trained and disciplined military. Um, So for some background, um, what he did was he he made it so that every province of their kingdom uh, had to draft men into the army, but he didn't impose a mandatory military service for everyone in the kingdom, and that was that was important because he understood that if he forced every man you know of fighting age to go into the army, that it would be an economic disaster because they have to still figure out how to like eat, you know. Um, because the conditions were super harsh but despite that i think he's still able to put together a kind of what we would consider today a national army it was like a quasi national army which again you have to remember all of you know uh, all of these other people that we talked about these were all mercenary forces right they would just pay people to wreck shit but not gustavus right he had different ideas about this he thought that he wanted to make an army that was made up of swedes not mercenaries that all spoke Swedish and had a common culture and goals. And this was super important, I think, to the effectiveness that they had in battle. Um, You know, they were able to fight along their fellow Swedes and have a sense of like Swedish identity and, and brought motivation and determinations for their soldiers to fight. And I think, you know, I'm I'm reaching here a little bit, but if I'm reading it, uh, you know, I think maybe France might've shared in that, idea you know like they they, france wanted to establish a firm identity you know a a homogenous uniform french identity and and what gustavus adolphus was doing in in sweden kind of lent itself pretty well to that so it kind of made them pretty well aligned even though they were on opposite sides of the spectrum in terms of their religion notwithstanding uh you know kind of moving along but um where was this is oh right this is this is where you get into the construct of nationalism. Right. You know, because nationalism, when you really think about it, it's a construct. And not to sound like some goofy social scientist or something like that, but nationalism is a construct. Like when you create a nation, there's a process that, that takes place 
where you have to get everyone to buy into it first. You have to get everyone to comply into it by doing things, by speaking a a common language language and following a common culture. And also, the biggest part of it is complying with the monopoly of violence that the state produces. Because that's what a state is. A state is a monopoly on violence that that's what a nation state really is and and that's what france and that's what a lot of these european states at the time were in the process of doing the the monopoly of violence that the holy roman empire was trying to create or at the very least you know catholic partisans within the holy roman empire were trying to create was that experiment gone completely wrong Right. And that's why it was so bloody. But also, you know, the way that they enacted it was, you know, by outsourcing it. <laughs> right? By out by, by outsourcing, outsourcing it. Right. They which were like, is which is the worst way to do it. You guys were, do it, right? <laughs> right? Um, they were getting they were getting mercenaries from everywhere. There there were so many foreign mercenaries. They were coming from Italy, they were coming from the Ottoman Empire, they were coming from Scotland, they were coming from England, they were coming from Spain, they were coming from God knows where. And you know what else happens when you have a lot of foreigners in, coming into your country? At this time, disease is spread. Right. I mean, look what happened when the Europeans went to South America. Wiped out 90% of the population here. Right. So that was another big factor in how disease is spread just by foreigners coming in contact with other people. Right. And yeah, like, you know, mercenary armies are mercenary armies. They're fighting for a paycheck. They're not fighting for any type of, you know anything that you would die for you right know? like <laughs> but but again coming back to like uh, gustavus adolphus's like idea he, like, he wanted to break that right he wanted to make being a soldier not like some sideline job but like a career um and so the way he was able to do this was he actually instituted like regular payments of salaries uh that he made to these conscripts so at the time sweden was able to afford most of these payments um to their soldiers because of the riches that they got from the Catholic Church when they seized a bunch of land uh, during that Protestant Reformation prior to the um, the, the Peace of Augsburg. Um, but they were able to pay them yearly wages and like a cloth allowance, which was, you know, in high demand at the time, uh, especially up north. Um, but also Gustavus introduced like a system to make the communities of each of the um, uh, uh, like areas of the uh, uh, of his kingdom pay into it like pay take part in paying their own soldiers uh and you know it sounds like oh shit taxation like how would they do that but i actually think he had a pretty effective way of doing this without making it too much of a burden so uh basically what he would do is uh soldiers that had like a rank of private or above uh they would get a payment from the taxes that were paid by the farmers in in their community um and they would also get like a place to stay in in their community but not for for just free but it was an exchange for work right while during like peacetime so in exchange for farming or or you know handiwork or whatever they were doing they had a place to stay and they got some some payment and this actually worked out pretty well because it manufactured like pride and respect for swedish soldiers in swedish communities because it was like it it wasn't you know some foreign mercenary that is taking our money right it's you know fucking joe over here who lives and works this farm but he just happens to be like a career soldier and when they need him he goes and does his thing you know um and i think you know i mean it even came down to gustavus adolphus paying soldiers like out of his own pocket you know monthly wages whenever he needed to to so he was pretty generous in that respect but outside of just like money straight up he also created a uh like a pension for his soldiers um and he said like if you serve 25 years in the army, uh, which I guess with a 30-year war, you could totally do this. Um, if you serve for 25 years um, and you reach the age of 50, uh, you get land, um, which Sweden had plenty of, right? They had more land than they had cash available. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, all right, I'm getting paid, right? I'm getting paid my salary. You know, I have like a regular job in the community. I could do farming and stuff like that. So it's still helpful for our community and like for the economy. And also like if I 
get this in for 25 years, like later I'll have a little bit of land for myself, right? So it made it like an interesting and exciting prospect for people. So people were actually signing up to do this. Um, it made being a soldier a career. Um, and, and, and making soldiers a career, like being a soldier, is, is absolutely the first step in building a, a professional army. You it's know? getting specialties on violence that are that are I guess are loyal to a nation state. Exactly. Instead of specialties of violence that could flip on you, um, you know, depending on the way the wind's blowing. You know, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, this would be a question I'm very. I would be really curious to ask um, a historian of European military history. Was there anything like this? between Gustavus Adolphus and the Roman Empire in Europe. What do you mean? That were not roaming bandits because a lot of the big armies in, in well, Europe were, were, were just were barbarians. Yeah, I mean... Roaming nomadic bandits. Pre- previously, it wasn't... It wasn't... Um, you had two options, right? You had either... Um, maybe three. Uh, forced conscription, which is when, you know, like a king or a duke or whoever would go through the uh, the land and say, by order of decree, because we're having a war, anyone above the age of 16 or something like that, that's a male and isn't like totally useless, has to be a, a soldier. And they would get them together and be like, here's a sword, here's a pike, you know, and if you're any good at shooting, maybe here's a, a, a gun. And uh, Your king calls you the arms. <laughs> exactly, right? Pr- and, Prince and, Duke of Wellington calls yeah. you to fight for the glory and just God. Gondor calls. <laughs> Gondor calls. <laughs> they lit the beacon. Anyway, so like, they, they would just basically call you up, right? And then you would do your war thing. And uh, if you survived, you just go back home and then that's it, right? You go back to your business, right? If, you, if you're a cobbler, cool, you go back to doing that. If you're a farmer, cool, whatever. The, the other option was, all right, well, we need an army now, so let's just pay random foreigners to run around and kill people for us. And then when we're done, we tell them to go away, right? Um, and those were the options. And, and Adolphus basically changed that. He was like, no. I think we should actually train these people and like make them a part of the community and like make them productive and also pay them and offer them pensions and stuff like that. So th- th- at least from what I've read, this is what, you know, what he did. But besides creating a standard army, like a standing army and, and regularly paying soldiers, you know, uh, there, there was a kind of an ethical and moral reason behind it. You know, like soldiers that were paid with salaries were less susceptible to the shit that the mercenaries were doing, which was, you know, looting and carnage, right? A professional army, they basically, because they live within the communities, they have to have like this semblance of like a good image, right? They have to upkeep that, right? And they have to- Well, wait, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah, sure. Swedes, the Swedes were- brutal in that oh, war. Oh, of course. They but, were not, like, going around oh, showing course, the German not, population not respect. To, like, oh, Mr. Swedes, Friendly, doop <laughs> doop do, 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 oh, it's PewDiePie <laughs> coming, like... You know, like, they were brutal for everyone else, right? That's what they were trained and, and, like, conscripted to do. But what I meant was, you know, previously, if you were a mercenary or sellsword, like, oftentimes these people, when they decided to settle down in the areas that they were, you know told to be a mercenary and there's this foreigner guy and he's like ah this is my land now because fuck you you know and you know they didn't care what the people of those communities thought of them because they're getting paid by the by the hegemony you know like that they have official decree right this is like wallenstein wallenstein didn't give a fuck about any of the people in in the holy roman empire he was getting paid and he was a badass right as opposed to, you know, these Swedish people, like, right, when they're not fighting, they have to be a, a productive member of the society so that the society keeps paying them, you know? Um, so there was a bit of a, like, an ethical standard there. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, while Adolphus's ideas were kind of cool, it, there was still a shortage of manpower, and it wasn't completely solved. So they, they definitely did have mercenaries, and it was mostly the Scots. Um, but unlike other armies that just basically you know, paid a, a a mercenary unit to fight as a separate unit. He, what he wanted to do is like, all right, fine. If I have to buy mercenaries, they have to be trained by us and they have to fight alongside us. They also have to speak Swedish, right? Um, and so he tried as best as he could to integrate mercenaries into his own army to try and create a more cohesive unit. And it was actually pretty effective, right? Um, and so after recruitment, some changes that he made were... Um, 
you know, basically in training, right? So previously, remember, I gave you the two options, right? Either I pluck you out of the fields and give you a, a pike and say, go point them with the, you know, poke them with the, the pointy end. Um, or, you know, we buy cell swords and maybe they're good, maybe they're not, who knows. Um, he wanted to create a training program for these people, right? So it's it centered around like physical and combat training, a whole lot of discipline. They had like a lot of rules, right? So think like modern army, like drill sergeant stuff, you know, um, trainees were not allowed to swear or drink or go out with women. You know, it was it was a uh, pretty regimented. Um, and, you know, to, to further develop this army in battle, basically he would run military exercises, you know, and it involved numerous amounts of units. Right. So like like actual training sessions where they would do maneuvers in the field. Um, and this was so that he can teach each soldier all the parts of the parts that they needed to play and the things that they needed to do in a combat situation. So, you know, they were actually trained instead of just some random farmer that they gave a pike to, you know? And this is kind of important because this is what made his army flexible, maneuverable, you know, and, and you know, that I think this was a huge part and, and another reason why he's the father of, uh, of modern warfare. Well, another reason why he is is because of his use of artillery. All right. I want to get to that, but not yet. <laughs> not yet. Because uh, that one probably is my favorite. Um, uh, so so um, he, he, he made some changes uh, so, um, to just the, um, the, the makeup of an army, right? So this one was pretty cool. Um, in Europe, you know, for trained professional soldiers, mostly mercenaries, but... Um, especially in the Holy Roman Empire, they used this like battle formation called a, a tertio, I think it's called, tercio, tercio, whatever. And it was just basically thousands of men lined up in squares that are like 10 by 10, right? Um, and what they would do is they'd take pikemen, uh, they were in the inside, right? Pikes are like long pointy, you know, lances, whatever, sticks with pointy parts. And, um, and then... This thing called an arc boussier, uh, which is a, it's a gun. That's all you need. It's a, it's a long gun with like a fucking stick for you to hold, like a tripod, um, a monopod, I should say. Um, and so they had the pikemen in the middle, and they were surrounded by the gunmen. Um, but it had like uh, pretty distinct weaknesses that I think Adolphus was able to take advantage of. So um, one of it was the concept of this tertio. Uh, they would the gunmen would fire their shots and then the pikemen would move forward to defend the soldiers uh the shooters uh while they're reloading um because the arc the the shooters were in the back like reloading the pikemen advancing wouldn't have like a ton of space to move around or even to move back and retreat when they needed to um and also uh because of the nature of these pikes that they had the pikemen didn't they couldn't really swing left and right. They didn't have that luxury. Their pikes were long, heavy, difficult to move. Um, so another issue of this tertia um, was their over-reliance on firepower, right? So, you know, as soon as guns came onto the scene, everybody was like, yo, guns are dope. More guns, 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 right? Uh, but the guns sucked. <laughs> and, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, like, overdid it on on the shooters so they have way more shooters than pikemen which means they would go these long stretches of time where nothing's happening because they're just re reloading right so during those days and what's the average load time on, oh, a, oh, on a dude 17th century musket <laughs> i i can't i don't like even 90 know. seconds I, longer it may be longer 90 seconds that. if you're fucking dope right but lo longer um I, I can't put an exact tally on it but just to give you an idea right they, they weren't well developed it was super cumbersome. First of all, super inaccurate. Like those guns at the time, the 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 fire arc boussier or whatever they're called. Um, they had like a little stick, like a monopod, that they would have to rest the gun on in order just to try and get a good shot, right? So they they would have to prop it up on a stick, and then fire it. So it's super inaccurate, short range, and it took so long to load. And part of the reason why it took so long to load is because there was no standardization of these guns, right? They actually had to take out like a little thing of gunpowder and measure out exactly how much gunpowder they had to put in. If you put in too much, it might blow up. If you put in too little, it's just not going to fire very well, you know? And then like get it all together. It sucked, right? And so... Um, and, gun, and, that, and that would kill you if that gun blew up in your yeah, face. I mean, it might kill you. Uh, at the very least, it would prevent you from doing your job, <laughs> 
you know it would it would de- it would you would become a casualty of war you would you would not be an asset on the battlefield right well so if a gun exploded in your hand right well i mean unfortunately the way that the holy roman empire uh utilized gunmen were basically shoot and if you're not shooting you're reloading and if you can't do either you're just a pawn you're a meat shield you know because you're useless because that's all you can carry is a gun and the stuff to shoot the gun with <laughs> you know like your your ammunition and that's it, you know? Like, they didn't have anything else. Um, and so, uh, Adolphus, I think, he, he wanted to develop, it like, a, like, a type of tertio to be more mobile and effective. And so, what he did was he created these infantry brigades. And the, a brigade was composed of, like, 1,200 to 1,500 men. And each brigade was divided into a squadron. Uh, and it was made up of about 400. So, like, much smaller units than one giant fucking tertio. And each brigade would form six square, uh, like a square of six men deep instead of ten men deep, like the tertios of the Holy Roman Empire. And you think, well, that's smaller. Why, why would you do that? Well, there's reasons, and, and I'll get to that. Um, so he also changed the composition of each of them, right? Instead of like shooters outnumbering the pikemen, uh, Gustavus's squadrons had more pikemen than gunners, right? And that also sounds like counterintuitive because oh, we have guns, but You'll understand when I get to it. Um, so the the fact that he had more pikemen allowed the formation to be much more maneuverable and faster to attack, right? Because keep in mind, there are more people who can kill people at any point because you don't need to reload a pike, right? It's just stab somebody. You know, that's it. Um, and he realized that that gunners in general like have weren't really a big threat because they were inaccurate and they're super hard to load having pikemen is just easier, right? You just charge forward, right? And and this reminds me of like how, you know, insurgencies will use simpler technology to overwhelm people with better firepower. Uh, uh, one thing that pops out of my head is when the Houthis, you know, took over how many brigades, like was it two brigades of Saudi um, uh, uh, mercenaries, basically, that were armed to the teeth with the best possible guns. And these dudes are in sandals and like, you know, just using the land right and being maneuverable, right? So this is exactly like that, right? Gustavus had, he was ahead of his game. Um, And so uh, to make those pikemen maneuverable, he also um, shortened the length of the pikes to make them longer and to make them more deadly, he put iron tips on them, right? So now they're shorter, they're lighter, they can be used quicker, they have more of them and they're iron tipped. Um, And here's the best part. For the guns, now, quality over quantity here. This is what he was all about. So he actually had artisans hand make special guns, right? And what was important about this was that uh, he wanted to make matchlock muskets that were lighter and easier to fire. And later on, he was able to, you know, uh, uh, make it so that they were light enough and, and easy enough to fire that they didn't need that stupid pole you know, to, to hold it up and aim with, right? You could just shoulder fire it, um, which made it much easier. That's one less thing to carry, right? Um, also, this is cool. So he basically made it easier for soldiers to fire and reload by standardizing all of the ammunition. So he standardized specific calibers for weapons. Um, and he also, so remember I was telling you, like it takes a super long time to, to like load uh, a gun. Well, previously, uh, um, what they had to do was measure a specific amount of powder to load the gun. I was saying that before, and measuring took time. And because of the different calibers of the of the of the rounds that they were using, right? They weren't like a standard caliber. Uh, if it, if you had a bigger bullet, you needed more gunpowder. If you had a smaller bullet, you needed less gunpowder, and that caused some like logistical problems. So they standardized it all. And this part was cool. They basically made like little magazines uh they would take these like rolls of paper and they would fill it with a precise amount of gunpowder and and a standardized caliber uh round and all they needed to do was tear off the piece of paper pour in everything into the gun and then you're ready to go just shoot which is really cool yeah that's amazing so they had like how how does that look so they had papers filled with with the gunpowder, like the exact amount of gunpowder that they would need, and based and off the, the and the ball, off, yeah, and, and a ball. standard ball, right? So, how? What do you think? 
the time how much time are they saving reloading their guns i don't know uh it's that's hard to tell (laughs) and i'm obviously not a super expert on this but like just thinking about it like imagine if you had to specifically measure out a specific amount of gunpowder based on the size of the ball that you're about to shoot because the sizes were always different right so just like thinking about that out loud i feel like it would take me like two minutes maybe if i was really good the old way but in the new way it was like you know i mean they they made bandoliers like 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 ammo pouches with a bunch of like pre-rolled joints of you know (laughs) uh, of gunpowder and 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 bullet and all they need to do is tear it off they could probably tear it off with their teeth right pour it into the damn thing and shoot like i imagine you probably get that down if you're like if you're sick at it you probably get it down to like i don't know less than a minute maybe 30 seconds Uh, that's my best guess i actually don't know (laughs) and then this is these are verse units that are i mean we don't know how long it takes them to reload a gun i'm sure a gun expert listening to this probably has a better understanding of probably cringing right now for my (laughs) description but um yeah i mean like think about it so he reduced the amount of gunners but he increased the firing rate And he increased the accuracy, so you need less gunners, right? So he had better guns, faster, more maneuverable, standardized ammunition, right? And and more pikemen, so, like, there's always somebody killing somebody, (laughs) you know? Uh, So they were able to move around really, really fast. And finally, I'm getting to the really cool part, which you brought up, which is the, you know, uh, the greatest innovation that he did, which is, you know, um, in the field of mobile artillery, Right. So hearkening back to like this gun debate, right? Before, like cannons were these giant things, right? And they were largely stationary. Like you can, ahead of time, you can like roll one out into the field and like prop it up and whatever and then set down all the cannonballs. Um, But once it's set, like that's it. If your enemy wasn't on the receiving end of that cannon, like, well, you can't use the cannon anymore. (laughs) You know, like there's no moving it, there's no maneuvering it. Like it's just there, right? And so. Uh, what he did was he started with the same idea as the guns, right? So he standardized the caliber of the cannonballs to 24, 12, and 6-pound cannons, right? And also to make them more mover, like maneuverable, he made them lighter and with shorter barrels and thinner metal in the artillery tubes. And then he also developed these mobile artillery units that can move around on the battlefield. So what they did was... Um, they basically used a smaller three pound cannon on wheels that can be moved around. Right. And so each of these carriages, uh, would be manned by two to three men. Uh, and every mobile artillery, uh, unit was assigned to an infantry brigade and each infantry brigade had two to three mobile artillery units at their disposal. So, you know, 1200 guys had two to three cannons that can move around. Um, as opposed to, I don't know, 10,000 guys that are standing in one place, uh, maybe have more cannons, but they don't move and that's it. (laughs) And it was badass. Like he was able to, like, if you look at some of the maps of, you know, certain battles that took place, you can see how they were constantly shuffling where the position of the cannons were relative to where, uh, you know, their enemies were, they were able to move them around effectively enough to like to minimize the casualties and also maximize their deadliness which is dope you know super dope so that's that's interesting how he it's really interesting how he changed the way that artillery was used because prior to that artillery was mainly just used on boats right yeah boats boats and castles castles, like uh, fortified positions right because these things were like hundreds if not thousands of pounds right so once you put them there like they're not going anywhere like that's it that's where they are that's where they live so were there like so how exactly did they move them again so they moved them with with well so uh, like obviously they still had the big ones right but they made them lighter by using lighter materials and shortening the barrels right that does compromise some of the range but like it's better to be able to move them around than anything else and with the standardization of the of the cannonballs to be like the same sizes they were able to manufacture them and also many like 
just like how they did with the with the bullets obviously you can't put a 24 pound cannonball and gunpowder for it in a paper thing but it was easier for them to like know exactly how much powder you need for a 24 pound cannonball right um and then the super mobile ones were the three pound ones that they made the three pound cannonballs and they would just put it on a little carriage like like think about a cannon that you know like a stereotypical cannon that you think of like a field cannon on wheels you know and two to three guys would just pick it up and move it around so how would you supplement that with cal like with uh like cavalry tactics and stuff like that yeah so that that's a good question so he changed a lot of the tactics that were used by cavalry um and so one thing that he stole basically from uh you know the polish and the russians which we've talked about this like the tachankas right um i mean obviously tachankas came a little bit later but um they've been doing this for a while uh is when you cavalry charge you fire your gun while you're charging you know you don't sit down stand in one place shoot and then charge no you charge and you shoot and with these lighter cannons they were able to move them throughout the field fire off a shot and then keep moving you know uh and so they changed the tactics there and so they they had this um a uh, uh, Finnish light cavalry known as the I'm going to butcher this shit let me see Hakapelitas Hakapelitas um and they were used as like shock troops uh and so they would run them up on people fire their guns and then when they hit when they finally made contact with with the enemy they would pull out sabers and just like cut them to pieces it was crazy it was like uh, uh I don't know it was like some Lawrence of Arabia shit it was cool And what happened to the so Gustavus Adolphus? He ends up dying now. Yeah, yeah. So I was just gonna say, like all these tactics. He's, like kind, of, and things. he's kind of like he's kind of like King Ale- uh, Alexander the Great, right? Exactly. I mean, he, I'm sure he would have loved he, that. Where he's leading like cavalry charges and right. stuff like that. He ends up actually getting himself killed, though. Right. I mean, all all these awesome tactics aside, like he did end up dying in a in a charge. So maybe maybe they weren't that good, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, he, he was a victim of the fog of war, you know, and just straight up chaos on the battlefield. So, you know, you can have a plan, you know, but, you know, in war, it's chaos. So, you know, he, he got he got killed, you know, and, and um, not knocking the guy or anything like that. Like he, he did a pretty good job at what he needed to do. Um, but that basically turned it turned around this Swedish phase. That was pretty much the end of it at the time. You know, he was like the Stannis Baratheon, right? Like the 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 what are the prince that was promised basically and the moment that he died um the swedes lost this kind of like unifying commander and they stopped being as effective as they were before and so this is when they switched to the french phase where okay previously the french were just paying the the swedes to do the fighting uh but now it switched and they said okay well we're not doing well anymore the french will now fight and the swedes will fund the french and that's that's kind of where we got at. So they reversed it. Mm-hmm. So the French supplied the soldiers. The Swedes provided the capital for the war. Right. And take note that at the same time, so we're now we're at a point where it's two Catholic powers fighting each other in this war. Right. right. <laughs> it's the French and the Habsburg Empire fighting each other. Mm-hmm. So there's two Catholic states fighting each other. A war that initially broke out over minor differences in theology i mean when you go back all the way back to martin luther like this is it's it's unbelievable that you have this war that's now just complete just complete geopolitics and and fighting over just political power and machiavellian reasons and you know the french kind of wrap this up but this war goes on for when gustavus adolphus dies i forget the exact date that he dies and I read the account of when he died. Well, it wasn't the account. Um, it was more of like a romanticized version of him dying. And, you know, he was like found on the battlefield and some soldier was like, who are you? And he's like, I am the king of Sweden. And they killed him. <laughs> um, maybe that really happened. I mean, it sounds kind of pretty, pretty badass. Mm-hmm. 
However, do you duty? <laughs> I don't understand how you. I don't understand. Oh, do you? Is that Stannis yeah, Baratheon? Yeah. <laughs> Stannis Baratheon was not that great of a military commander. No, though, he wasn't. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Th- now that you're thinking about it, he completely botched Winterfell. Yeah. He completely botched the uh, battle. Blackwater Black Bay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He completely. He did. He never won a battle. Well, no. You got to put him at Rob Stark. So Rob Stark, the young wolf. When, when he came into the north uh, with, with the uh, with the um, why am I forgetting this shit? Uh, when the Night's Watch folk were up in the north, and he came in and slaughtered the shit out of uh, all of those uh, White Walkers and shit. That was that was a thing. Or no, not the White Walkers. The um, the Wildlings. Remember that? He won that. Yeah, the one battle against Wildlings who were exposed and. He flanked them with cavalry, just standing units. Yeah, well. And they were fighting the Night's Watch before. The Night's Watch were are the scrubs of of the Game of Thrones universe. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's a collection of the world's losers put in one castle. Right. Um. Anyway. I think Gustavus is more of a, a Rob Stark type of guy, or maybe Robert Baratheon. I don't know. Tell us in, uh, in a in a review on our <laughs> uh, uh, on this who episode. Who are these characters yeah, who do you compared think to Game of Thrones? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess like to kind of end it. Um, we're going. We're coming pretty close to an hour and a half. Um, yeah, the war completely became a a political struggle, right. um, and it ended with the two piece Catholic of... power, two Catholic powers fighting each other. While one of the Catholic powers, a.k.a. French, are suppressing the Huguenot movement, which was a Protestant movement within France. So you have characters like Cardinal Richelieu, who's a cardinal, you know, who went to school for religion, who was also a statesman, and was just completely Machiavellian in his, in his, uh, in, in what he was doing in the war. Not that I'm saying that being a identitarian and jumping on the Catholic side or the Protestant side based off common religion would be a, a better thing. I'm just saying that religion doesn't really matter to these maniacs who run these governments. Mm-hmm. Now, um, and the war ends up not solving anything. Right. It ended up in a stalemate. Nothing really happened. Well, they, they, they ended with the peace of Westphalia. Um, and if you were to put a winner down, I don't think you can, but like if you would, maybe France, because, and only for the reason that the Holy Roman Empire basically, I mean, it still existed after it, but it was like on its way out. It was, it became a, a almost the Holy Roman Emperor was the, was like the King of England or the Queen of England at this point. Like it was a, tit, a titular title right. um only in recognition didn't really have any political power and they broke or... off a lot of territory too so like switzerland gained its own like independence thing and this is where they get that like oh we're you know neutral or whatever then they have been since then uh which is interesting um but also brandenburg prussia uh which uh eventually would go on to you know create the prussian empire um you know they became a thing you know onto itself uh, there was a bunch of other like land carvings and like new states that popped up uh, as a result of it, but um, generally, yeah, like you said, a bunch of nothing happened, and everyone forgot why they started the fight, and they were just sick of it, and yeah. Well, the political consequences were enormous because this really brought the rise of the modern nation state right. as we know it today, like large centralized powers within Europe, like like France under Louis the Fourteenth. Um, rather than these autonomous states that were loosely controlled by kind of a figurehead type character like the Holy Roman Emperor who had some authority, but princes, you know, would have the tenacity to or audacity to to uh, disobey what he what his will was. So you have that and um, you have the rise really of France of the, the the nation state of France dominating Europe really until the rise of the British Empire in, and the rise the of the Prussian 1800s Empire too and, yeah. and, the, and the and the Russian Empire as well Pr- Prussian this, this, P- Prussian but really <laughs> they this is that that's really what it produced the rise of the modern in the failed 
experiment to create a nation, you have another nation emerge. And you can even say, and, and you know, I've, I've read that historians have said this as well, is that this led to, in nationalism, because whenever you think of any kind of a, um, the backstory of any nationalist movement, there's always some type of humiliation that's involved. There's, there's always a humiliation within that nas- within that, that spark of nationalism. And you can pinpoint different groups. You can talk about the um, – if you talk about the Germans specifically, World War II, the humiliation is World War I. The creation of the modern German Empire when Otto von Bismarck unified all the German states within Central Europe together – one of the big, you know, that that moment of humiliation in their past was the Thirty Year War, right? Because again, the war was incredibly destructive, deadly, mm-hmm. and destructive, and humiliating. We're talking about a population that went from that dropped by millions and millions and millions of people. Um, half the males died. I think almost a third of the population died. It was pretty bad. Yep. It's as bad as you can get at that time period. Bad as you can get in general, I feel like, you know, like really? it, it got worse with World War Two and World War One, but like scheme of things, they didn't have the weapons or the you know, technology, the funding, you know. It's as bad as that situation could have got. Yep. You know, when you think about like how bad the the Protestant Reformation and how the schism and Christianity would produce a war, that's as bad as it could have gotten. Yeah. You know, sometimes you think about, like, man, it couldn't have gotten any... Like, you're like, could it Could it have got any worse? Nope. <laughs> that situation's like, I don't know, man. That's a pretty big bar. In the Middle East, I still think there's room for things to get a lot worse than they are oh, right God. now. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. However, um, that's the metaphor of the 30-year war compared to the Middle East. Um they start off. They could start off as secular, but they're sectarian. always subverted. Yeah. They sectarian, but they're always subverted by political aspirations, right? And outside um, influence. Mm-hmm. All right, you want to wrap this baby up? Yeah, I, man. Uh, this was cool. I thought this this was this was a cool, unique subject, and I'm glad that we tackled it. And I've been I've been interested in doing this episode for a while now, and um. I appreciate you uh, having the the uh, military insight to add a lot of context yeah, into fun. Gustavus uh, Adolphus because he's such a an unknown character in history that's incredibly interesting. Yeah, but there's so many interesting characters. We did not touch a one percent, yeah, one percent of like the craziness that happened in this yeah, war. We're talking between. about thirty years worth of war across hundreds of countries. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you guys like this episode, if you if you're interested in this topic, we'll we would love to do more on this topic. I know it's outside the ordinary type of um, subject matter that we cover, but um, this was a really fun topic to cover. It was really complicated the uh, the cover as well, but it's um, let us know if you like this episode. Let so, us know what else we'll, you want to hear. Yeah, and, and and let us know what you want us to to do or what you're interested in. But um, until then, rate and re- review the podcast. It's fucking late right now. Um, and I love all of you for giving us your time. <laughs> all right, I'm just going to stop. <laughs>